In this next set of videos, I'm going to focus on the concept of transactional memory. And let me first explain why this is such an important concept. So, you know, since 2003 or 2004, most, most uh, microprocessor manufacturers have moved to multi-core technology. So people have realized that increasing clock frequencies or making the core more complex does not really buy you much. In, in fact, it, it's, it's very bad from the perspective of power consumption. And so because of that, the cores have been kept relatively simple. And instead, we've tried to get higher performance by adding more cores onto a single chip. But this approach only works assuming that programmers are writing these applications that can be broken up into many different threads. And you know these threads can be run in parallel on the many different cores. Right? So it's only if you're writing these, these parallel applications that you can fully exploit the hardware that is now being produced. And that's the only way to get higher performance. Okay, so uh, one of the biggest problems before us today is to somehow make the process of writing a parallel program easier, right? So we, when we discuss cache coherence and when we discuss consistency models, we went through through a number of different examples, which showed us, you know, how hard it can be to write a parallel application, right? And this process is never going to become trivial. You know, this process is always going to be a little bit hard because we are expecting programmers to reason about you know what is happening in many different threads and you know what is happening in many different threads at the same time okay so uh, one of the holy grail problems before a computer architect is to see if there's something that we can do at the hardware level to make the programming process easier right if there's something that we can do then that perhaps greatly boosts programmer productivity and that makes it possible for people to write programs that can truly exploit the hardware that we are producing. Okay, so this is why I, I always like to discuss transactional memory in class, because it is a very concrete example of something that the hardware designer can do to try and boost performance. And you know, this this performance boost is happening indirectly by making it easy for programmers to write these high quality parallel programs. Okay, so before I explain the concept of transactional memory itself, I need to also go through some examples with log based code to show you, you know, what kinds of bad things can happen and you know, what, uh, what challenges can be overcome if you had instead used transactions. Okay, so um, let me first show you how deadlocks can be created if, if, I, was, if I was using locks to write my parallel program. So you know, let's take an example here where the programmer is acquiring a lock L1 and then it does something and then it realizes that it, it is touching some other shared variable which requires a different lock. So then it acquires lock L2. Okay, and then later you do an unlock L2, L2 and then later an unlock of L1. And all of this is happening in thread 1. And maybe a different thread 2 decides to first acquire lock L2 because it, it is touching some specific shared variable. Then later it realizes that it's touching something else which requires a different lock L1 and then so on. Right, so with an example like this, you know, many of you can already see that this can lead to a deadlock, right? So if this is the first operation that happened, this is the second operation that happened, then you try to do this, then you try to do this, right? So thread one holds lock L1, thread two holds lock L2, and now thread one is trying to is trying to acquire lock L2, which will never be fulfilled because that's currently being held by thread two, and thread two itself is not in any mood to release lock L2. Instead, it's trying to acquire lock L1, which is held by thread T1. Right, so in this case, you have a cycle of dependencies. Everybody is holding on to a resource and then asking for some other resource. And you know, there is there is there is a cycle of dependencies which then ultimately leads to a deadlock. Okay, so this is one of the bad things that could happen if you were using locks, and if if the programmer was was trying to acquire multiple locks at the same time. Okay, so why is why 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 was the programmer trying to acquire these multiple locks? Let's look at another example. So I'm going to skip ahead a few slides and go to this example over here. So this is an example where a task queue is being maintained and you know some threads are producing tasks and enqueuing these tasks onto the queue and that's being done with an enqueue function right so there's a queue of tasks over here and then some other threads are taking tasks from this queue and then working on them and, and completing them right and that uh, and, and they're using this DQ function to pull a task out of the queue Okay, so let's look at what is the specific code inside the NQ and the DQ. Okay, so you know, ignore this term that says transaction begin. Instead, you can use the term lock L1 and unlock L1 over here. And similarly over here, I will lock L1 and unlock 
L1. And you can quickly see why I'm doing this, right? So if I just quickly look into this code, I'll see that I'm possibly changing the values of head and tail, changing the values of head and tail over here as well, which is why I have to acquire this lock to, to confirm that only one thread is going to be changing these shared variables at a time. Okay, so you know, let's let's go into this code a little bit more. So if I'm doing an NQ, if 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 my queue is empty, then you know this becomes my only element, and both head and tail point to this. Okay, but if there are if there's more than one element, then when I'm doing an NQ, you know, currently my tail is pointing over here. I'm going to change tail to point to this new element that I'm adding over here, and I'm going to update this pointer to to uh, also include this element in the queue. Right, so you'll see that. In the common case where the queue has more than um, has has at least one element, you'll see that I'm making absolutely no change to head. All I'm doing is modifying the value of tail. But in the uncommon case where the tail where the queue is possibly empty, then I'm changing the changing the values of both head and tail. Instead, if I look at the dequeue function, the first thing I need to do is check to see if if the queue has any elements at all. Right. So I've I've left that out of this code. But once I determine that the queue has some elements, I'm now going to dequeue. Uh, this next task and so the first thing I do is I check to see if the queue has more than one element if it has more than one element then all I need to do is pull this guy out and head which used to point to this is now going to point over here right so when there's more than one element I'm only changing the value of head but if there's only a single element and I pull this out you know head and tail were both pointing to this now both have to point to null Right, so if there was only one element, I have to change the values of both head and tail. Okay, so you'll see that you know that, that that yes, both threads can possibly touch head and tail, but that's perhaps the uncommon case where the queue only has either zero or one element. Okay, but in the common case where you have you know more than one element, it's possible that you know both of these threads are touching different variables altogether. Okay, so truly speaking, when somebody is doing an NQ and there's more than one element, it is safe for me to allow a parallel DQ. And that should improve performance, right? If both of these happen in parallel, one modifies tail, one modifies head, right? There should really be no conflict, okay? But in this case, because there's a small possibility of a conflict, I had to introduce, like, I had to introduce a lock up front. This is called a coarse-grained lock because I introduced only one lock for the entire function, and that reduced my performance because at one time I can only be doing one NQ or one DQ. In parallel, I can't be doing NQs and DQs, even though it might have been safe to do it. Okay, so if uh, so, so, so as a programmer, the first thing I might have tried is to introduce a coarse grain lock because that's easier to write. Then I observe performance, and then I realize that I'm losing some performance because I can't do NQs and DQs in parallel, whereas this should be safe most of the time. Okay, so as a programmer, I say, well, you know, to improve performance, I'm going to introduce fine grain locks. Okay, let me show you how that would work. Okay, so the first thing I do over here is I acquire a lock that says I'm getting in into an NQ operation, and so I should not prevent I, I should prevent others from also doing NQs at the same time. Okay, but it's okay for others to do DQs at the same time. So similarly over here, I'll acquire a lock saying I'm going to acquire a special lock for the DQs, which prevents others from doing D D doing DQs, but it's it should be safe to do a parallel NQ at the same time. Okay, then I check this condition. And then if I'm going to enter the, the this then part of the code, which is the corner case, right, which is where I'm possibly changing head and tail, that's when I say that, well, you know, since I'm changing the value of head as well, I should acquire a second lock. And so here I acquire a second lock that says, I'd also like to prevent DQs from happening at this time. Okay, because I'm, you know, I'm also possibly changing uh, the value of head. And so, you know, this is the corner case that I need to be better prepared for. Okay, and whereas this thread would also similarly do lock of, you know, it, it would acquire the second lock to make sure that NQs can't happen at the same time. Okay, and, and right here you can see that this is where I'm causing a possible deadlock. Okay, and in some versions of the code, after you've acquired the lock, you need to recheck the condition, right? Because, you know, you check the value of tail being null, but by the time you acquired the second lock, maybe the value of tail has changed. Maybe some other thread has come along and change the value of tail. That might not happen in this specific example, but it could happen in some other codes, right? So once you acquire the lock, you have to again check the condition. If that condition is no longer true, you have to get out of this entire process and start all over again. Okay, so you can see that, you know, if I want high performance, I have to use fine-grained locks, 
and that's fairly complex to deal with because it needs that, I, that it, it requires me to introduce you know many more conditions, a lot more checks, and in doing all of this, I'm also possibly creating a deadlock. Okay, so using fine grain locks, you know, gives you higher performance, and that's a positive, but the programming process is a lot more complex. And the exact opposite is true when I'm using coarse grain locks. Okay, so you know these two examples kind of highlight why I'm using transactions, and let me just summarize that really quickly over here. So if I use locks, I'm possibly creating deadlocks. Okay, and you know if I use coarse grained locks, then it's poor performance. If I used fine grained locks, then it is a lot of programmer effort. And transactional memory helps because it eliminates deadlocks. It allows you to get high performance with a coarse grained mechanism. Okay, so it is as easy to program as coarse grained locks and it has as much performance as fine grained locks. So it combines the best of both of these two approaches.